Hello, everyone. Welcome to Atomo. Andrew here. It is Monday, January 30th. And what I thought I'd do for you today is let's talk about let's talk about Ukraine and you know what happens if we send a few tanks over and we I don't mean I'm not I don't mean I'm participating and advocating that we send tanks over uh, being I'm in Canada I'm not advocating for that so I just want to make that clear actually I'm my stance is I'm against that. I'm more on the peace side. Let's figure something out. But as always, the neocons are wanting to ride the escalation escalator and see what they can get away with. And what I'm doing here and other commentators, we say we want to do peace try to figure out how we can bring stability and prosperity back to the region. Let's start talking about that. But since the neocons want to throw some Western equipment over to the Ukrainian forces, let's take a look at that. So here's what I'll do is let's take a look at how we are organized right now. Now, here we go, we're in Google Maps here, and we're looking at the Odessa area of Ukraine. Now, one of the things we have to do is you have to zoom out and see, Ukraine is a big chunk of land. Like, let's not kid ourselves, look, it looks like it's even longer than France, looks like it might even be as long as Turkey. It, and look, I probably can take the United Kingdom, scrunch it up, and throw it into Ukraine as well. So the battlefield, if we're looking at, here's Kherson, here's Saprosia, Donetsk, Luhansk. So one, two, three, those are the four areas, Kherson, Saprosia, Donetsk, and Luhansk that have been um, brought over by the Russians through the referendum. Uh, to bring those areas into Russia. And so that constitutes a front line even come up. So if we go from here at Kharkiv and kind of draw kind of a bit of a horseshoe around this area in eastern Ukraine, if you can see my mouse pointer moving down through there, then you, you kind of have the front lines. And if you look at the scale down there, like just... Moving the mouse a couple of centimeters constitutes about 50 kilometers of front line. This is an enormous front line that's being set up, okay? So I want to put that into perspective. So think if I were to drop a car. Yes, a car. So if you were to take your motor vehicle, your car, and you were to drop it on this map, the spec wouldn't even show up. Now... Let's take a look at here. Okay, let's wind this back up. So this is a website, U.S. Department of Defense. And it looks like the, um, I don't know how to get this piece to show up better, but I'm just using what is available here. So if we look at, well, what would make up if we were to send tanks over and again, when I say we, I'm not saying that I'm participating in this. I'm just going to say we, as in, yeah, I belong in a country of the collective West. So if we send it, then, you know, my head's on the line as well for any retort retaliatory action. Uh, heaven forbid, if we're put onto a, a strike package and you live in a larger city and the Russians say, yeah, you're, your country donated something to the Ukrainian war effort. Well, somebody's writing your city on top of a nuclear warhead somewhere. Again, I'm not advocating violence, but, you know, also don't want us to turn into glowy ash. So <clears throat> there's that. So if tanks are being sent, well, what we'll do is we'll go through, well, how much uh, does this constitute? 
So if we look at a team, now a team, if I put four soldiers, I, I put in using an Abrams tank, I would have four soldiers in a tank um, because there's four positions in an Abrams tank. Commander, driver, gunner, loader. Okay. Then what happens is we start to put these uh, tanks together into squads, and I'll show a different photo or a different picture uh, showing this. And then you have the platoon. So platoon, uh, two to three squads. In an armored platoon, you'll have four tanks. So a tank platoon, four tanks, and there's four crew members per tank. We organize into a company, three to four platoons, and I believe there's four platoons in an armored company. I have another graphic coming up. I just want to give you the sense of scale and size. So at this point, if we send a company over of four tank platoons, so it's going to take, well, it's saying 200 soldiers here. And let's say, you know, the, the purists might say, well, no, 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 an infantry, infantry and tank, different things. But let's just go with some round numbers here. So at this point, we're looking at 200 soldiers. Um, there, so we're at four platoons. Okay, so four times four, we're at 16 tanks. So what that probably means is now when we go up to the company level, if we're sending about 50 or 60 tanks, now Canada is sending four. Canada's sending four tanks. So four tanks is just a platoon. That's what, that's what I heard. So yeah, I'm going to pledge four tanks. Four tanks is a platoon. Okay. We go back to the map here. Think about placing four tanks on this map somewhere. Four tanks on this map. Four little dots that just will not show up. I think. Canada is going to turn the tide of the war with just four tanks, even 50 tanks. Probably not. Okay. Once we get up to battalion levels, now things are starting to look a little more. We're up to a thousand soldiers. And by the time we get to a brigade, this is where, in my opinion, is if, if this were to be committed to a front line in Ukraine. Now we're starting to talk about some serious equipment. Now we're talking 3,000 to 5,000 soldiers. Just as a reminder, uh, last year, Russia called up 300,000 soldiers. Okay. So two to three battalions. We have to do some math with this some multiplication to determine, well, how many tanks would this be? And yeah, my, my brain's not good enough for that. We do a platoon, so there's um, four tanks. If you do it times three, then you, you get do it times four, just if you really want to go on the on the other side. So you get four times four times four times four, if you just want to use rough math, you know, and that will give you kind of your power distribution on this. We really wanted to make a dent. This this used to be in like, okay. So we take an example: the uh, third armored in Western Europe. So after Normandy and D Day, and the tanks were landed, there was an armor division. So we're looking at ten thousand to fifteen thousand soldiers. Okay, so that's a now we're talking significant numbers. So if we're talking about, you know, 30 or 300,000 from the Russian side and the, the, the Russian distributions are a little bit different. But if you look at that, it's like, okay, so you probably have, you know, round about 15 divisions or so of soldiers. And so the West is not even sending a division in this case. 
and then you have a core. So this is when you really start to get, you know, if there was a whole armored core in Ukraine, this, it would be very significant firepower. This, but this would represent an existential, uh, so now we're at, if the whole army group were deployed, so here's kind of the equivalent of what, of what the Russians are potentially going to uh, place on the map is a whole army group uh, that they've raised. So this just gives you something to think about. Now, the U.S. were to deploy this, that would be massive that would that would just be mind-boggling and that would be an existential threat to russia and we probably would be seeing glowy fireballs appearing um so let's go to got a website here battle order so let's go back down to the company level so again, from this side, we're shrinking back down to this level, three to four platoons in a company. So we got uh, France, looks like Italy, oh, Poland is showing up there. So I might do a, a click into a Poland tank company with, and I like this, how they have the different ones up here. So I'll leave this for you. So you got uh, an Abrams company. So Poland this is one of the reasons why you might see some talk with Poland. Poland's quite used to, here we go, we got T-72. So Poland is used to the different types of equipment. Okay. And if they want to run the Leopard 2. So if Equipment is, and this is, this is just my conjecture based on uh, if equipment were to be routed through, and I believe um, there was one YouTuber that showed there's some calling up in Poland. And what she showed is, and I had her, um, I called out to her on the channel here, that Poland was calling up people as well to, to join their army. And they were looking at the daily rates of it. And it's quite possible that you know, Poland seems to have motive to want to join in. Uh, and we have to see how that plays out. You know, earlier in the war, Putin was saying, and I don't have a quote, but it was like, okay, if any equipment enters Ukraine, we're going to hit it early in, in the war. There was some staging outside of Lviv and some missiles showed up. They arrived and hit the staging area. And we believe that they were hypersonic missiles because none of the defenses went up. So now you see it. Now you don't poof. You know, it got hit pretty hard. That kind of set the tone that you know, if you want to commit forces, then they're going to be fair game once they enter the Ukrainian theater. Okay. I just want to come back to, you have three types of equipment here. You have Abrams, you have the old, um, if you got the, the T dash variants, T72 was the, like your kind of your opponent to the Abrams, the U S Abrams. So Abrams usually went up against T-72s. If you go back to the late stages of the Cold War, those was the equipment. Uh, I played many, many, many war games based on this. Um, Team Yankee was, was the biggest board game that I played that had all this uh, stuff organized. So playing that enough, I've been able to gain some knowledge of this equipment. If we go down to in here, here is another big difference. There is a Ukrainian one here. So here's a Ukrainian tank company that they've added. So here, T-72, because they're using the old uh, Soviet equipment. <laughs> and you think, well, how easy is it? When Zelensky visited the Congress um, back last year, oh, yeah, I think it was late last year, 
and said, yeah, just give us the equipment. We're fine. We, we, <laughs> there was some laughter at that. Give us your planes. Give us your tanks. We're fine. We'll be able to figure it out. <laughs> and there's some chuckles. I, I, let me shine some light on what this means is, okay, if this is the primary units that you have and what you're looking at, take a note of, okay, well, there's three soldiers here. Huh, interesting. There's three soldiers there. What if we were to give them some Abrams? Let's go to yeah, the M1. The M1 is the Abrams. There's uh, there's the M1, that's the original. There's the M1A1, and then the M1A2. Now, there's newer equipment being developed that's not ready yet. The, uh, the MX, I believe. So what you're seeing here is an organization of a company. So we've got three platoons of tanks, plus you have a headquarters company, which has two tanks to it. So you have the CO tank and your EXO, your executive officer tank that sits in the company. Four people per tank, because Abrams tanks use an actual meat loader. Yes, there's a person who loads the shells. Um, <clears throat> In the T-72, there is an auto loader that does it for you, okay? So just different concepts. You don't need to use as many people, but you do have the auto loader uh, for better or for worse in the, in the Abrams tank, given that if if one of your crew member is wounded, then usually what the loader can do is jump to a different position. The loader is close to the gun and close to the commander's hatch. So the loader would be able to, if you need to do some spotting in the moment your commander gets knocked out, then your loader can take that over. If your driver's stuck in the driver compartment, they can't flip over quickly. But your loader and gunner can swap around like so there's interoperability between the positions uh, in the t72 if your auto loading mechanism gets knocked out well your gunner may then have to start to manually load uh, given that the equipment hasn't completely boggled the whole process so yeah i'm going a little bit deep into this but just want to give you an idea that can you just take people and throw them into an Abrams tank, well, if they're used to this configuration, they're going to have to unlearn some habits. That takes time. And in the heat of the battle, if you've trained up on this, you're going to be doing, you're going to have muscle memory that's going to be doing things in the way that you've been trained and drilled over and over and over again. The moment you have to like stop, break it down and go into discrete steps is like, okay, well, I have to kind of rotate here knee on a button, open the hatch, pull the round out, shift, jam it in, and then communicate what you're doing. It's a different, different, different routine. Different routine that has to be drilled. Now somebody firing shells at your tank and you hear this the bang of the shell going off smashing into the armor, maybe not penetrating. If you keep hearing that and a bit of that panic sets in, uh, now your fine movements turn into more gross movements and you know panic may set in. So, and I, I looked at the third armor division. This used to be in from the time when, uh, you know, about the Normandy time, to through the Cold War, there was a large armored division parked in Germany. Uh, the point of that was if the Warsaw Pact ever decided it wanted to come, uh, the Warsaw Pact is the old Soviet bloc of nations, which included Poland, by the way. <laughs> if they were to come racing over, then there's, uh, I think, three armored divisions. The third was the, the primary one that would intercept that and start to fight back. Uh, so that was a conventional deterrent that was set up in the area. So, you know, in summary here, we have this massive group of land uh, 
that needs to be covered. Commitments so far are four tanks from uh, Canada, I think 50 some odd from the US. Germany was like, ah, oh, we don't want to send any tanks. And, and then as I was counting the number of units, it's potentially what they're doing is they're sending a battalion, probably a few companies of equipment. Because even when, now, now you have to all go to a leopard too, because I to believe that's what Canada's running here. So even if I have different tank platoons organized, now you got a logistical problem on top of that. So how are you going to put organize four Canadian tanks with maybe some you know French tanks with some of the Polish tanks? Now you got different pieces of equipment, which means different complexities on your supply chain, different complexities for your logistics team here. Now all of a sudden they have to, there's different rounds, different shells. Hacker, you have to deal with different food that your soldiers are going to eat. Heaven forbid, it's like, oh my gosh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have, I don't have my soy pellets today. Oh my god, you got meat? No, we don't eat that. No. Where's my vegan Amari? So anyhow. So that's that. That gives you an idea of how these units are organized. And the summary here is you know. Joked before, it's the tip. We're going to give Putin a little tip. We're going to give him just the tip. Put a little bit of weapons in, but that starts the escalator running. Now it's like, oh, okay, if that equipment goes in, it's kind of like a test. We're going to send just, just a few tanks in. We're going to test and see how it goes. If that doesn't work out, then we'll figure it out, but we'll see what the response is. You know, does Russia escalate in turn, or do they? do what they've done before it's like oh yeah we figured out where the tanks are missiles bombardment boom the other thing you have to note is access points so how do you get this equipment into the front line well one area you have is odessa but super super close is you have sevastopol which has russian navy and plus you have to be able to get your material in through this little piece of water. And there are treaty obligations that Turkey can enforce in that piece of water. Oh, something else to think about. So if Turkey wants to block the access to the Black Sea, they can do that. That means now you have to come in. My thought is it may come in through uh, here in Poland, you got the you know, Lviv corridor like they've tried before, stage it in Poland. It's my thoughts is you do that. The Polish army works with different equipment. They're interoperable that way, so they will have the uh, they'll have the concepts in play when the equipment comes in. They can put Polish people that could potentially speak Ukrainian in there. And again, I'm going to make a guess, but you know what you do is you flag them up like they're from Ukraine, but they're not really from Ukraine. It's kind of like the Russian Wagner uh, organization, which is kind of a called up mercenary organization with people from different backgrounds. I don't think that they're all specifically Russian. But they're using mercenary armies right now. Russia has the money to pay for that, and they don't want to use up their own regular soldiers. I believe that they did that earlier in the campaign and realized uh, we don't like our people coming back in body bags. So what we'll use are like these um, prison convicts and mercenaries who are out for the blood money. We'll roll them in because then, you know, first of all, if they get captured, then, well, these people are from different parts, so you'll give the logistics over to your enemy for them to figure out how to deal with the prisoners, plus the families 
know, if you see the regular kids coming back in body bags, that increases war weariness. And the more that happens, the more people don't want to deal with the war. So Rush is playing it cool to make sure that war weariness is not going to set in at an alarming rate so that they can keep protracting out the battle. But what we may see is if these units have to come rolling in through Lviv, then they have to cut all the way across Ukraine. And Russia has already hit most of the electrical systems that run the rail and that means now you might have to switch to trains that run on fuel if they even have them anymore uh, to move equipment across because your substations are blown out um, and should those get repaired and equipment starts moving moving large amounts of equipment through your rail network given the state that uh, Ukraine is primarily, think of it as a co-mix of Russia and Ukrainian people. So you're going to have a large amount of people that can easily photograph something on the phone and say, oh, look, tanks are going by. And then that gets out into um, intelligence networks. And now Russia knows exactly where to target. So the other way is you just drive them across. And Abrams tanks need to be refueled every 12 hours, and they don't use diesel. They use a much more, uh, I think they even use airplane gas, I believe. I don't know if it's a kerosene uh, mix. I don't know. They have the turbine engine on it. Just trying to look at that earlier just to see. Here's an example here. So a U.S. Army brigade, you know, this says you know, 66 $67,000 per mile as this thing moves. And the range of the Abram limits a brigade to 205 miles, requiring fuel every 12 hours. So that is significant. That is an enormous amount of fuel. Uh, so you're going to have to stretch out a logistical chain across the map here in order to move those units and then keep those logistical chains in place, which means supplies have to be continuously trucked in, most likely, in order to keep this system running. And the moment you do that, if you take a look at, so you got this whole border here with Belarus. So if you were to move heavy pieces of equipment along some of these lines, you know, cruise missiles can come out of Belarus, for example. Belarus also has built up some military presence, probably more to be a deterrent um, against what might start happening if, you know, those, if there is, is a large type of escalation, then what we may see is potentially would Belarus play in any way? These are open questions that uh, almost it's a wait and see approach to this. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to leave it at that.